Dave Keller here with Stock Charts TV, and welcome to this latest edition of Behind the Charts. Our second season is filled with some amazing conversations with some really knowledgeable people. And this next conversation is with Jason Geffert from SentimentTrader.com. Uh, Jason is a, a thoughtful analyst, a, uh, a very well-informed investor, and his toolkit that he uses uh, with the Sentiment Trader website that he designed years ago was really to fill a void that he found. He found it was a very manual process to gather all the data that uh, he needed to analyze investor sentiment appropriately. And that came from an earlier job of his when he was uh, you know, working at a, uh, at a firm where he, it was more maintaining uh, customer counts. And he found that there was signal in terms of what customers were doing and what the market overall was doing. And so we built his, uh, his firm Sundial Research and Sundial Capital Research and then SentimentTrader.com focused on investor sentiment. I've used his research. I've subscribed to it uh, when I was on the institutional buy side. It was such a pleasure to hear how Jason has gone through this journey of focusing on investor sentiment, how he's taken a very manual process and turned it into a destination for a lot of institutional investors and what he's seeing about the market conditions right now. Here's my conversation with Jason Geffert. So Jason, it's a pleasure to sit down with you. Thanks so much for giving us some time. I've, I've as I've mentioned, you I've followed your work for uh, many, many years from my time at Fidelity and elsewhere, and uh, it's awesome to uh, to let everyone sort of learn a little bit more about you and uh, how you got to this point. Well, thanks, Dave. I appreciate it. Thanks for thanks for the invite. So uh, I know you're uh, you're in the deep north of Minnesota, uh, but give uh, let us know how you uh, where where did you start? Start at the very beginning. Where are you from originally? Uh, Northwest Wisconsin, so okay. not far, like an hour. So yeah. <laughs> pretty much the same thing. So small town, um, and you know it was it was a great place to grow up. Uh, I, I'm really glad I didn't grow up in a big city. Uh, really appreciated a love of the outdoors um, mm -hmm. that continues to this day. So I, I really do appreciate that part. But you know, with a small town, the opportunities are relatively limited. You know, when I think about our kids now and some of the opportunities they have with advanced learning and all this other stuff. That just that was not an option when I was going mm. to school. So, mm. um, so you know there were there were some downsides as well. And you know, and again, small rural town, money was not a focus other than you know we didn't have any. So, um, so I you know I at a really young age I determined I wanted to change that. So, uh, went to school um, at the University of Minnesota for finance, accounting, economics, um, and did the four years of theory. And then uh, my first job was as a controller of a small bicycle manufacturer. <laughs> and I learned immediately that theory had no place in the real world. Uh, I mean, it was it was it was shocking to me because I learned all the fundamentals, yeah. and certainly with a hard discipline like accounting, there are rules. There are you know there's A plus B equals C. There are definitely things like that. When it comes to business, um, kind of the broader perspective of business, there there are guidelines. There are tendencies. There are very few rules, and um, I learned that very quickly. So. Um, I mean, it was it was a really inter interesting story. It was the guy that started rollerblades. Um, he decided to create a bike where, that you row, a uh, rowing bike. Wow. And so um, the company that I worked for actually manufactured that. Well, it was made out of steel. It was heavy. And so they kind of fought. And so this guy decided he was going to take the manufacturing to China. So that's fine. I mean, they could have negotiated all that. But the owner of the company that I worked for, just it was an ego thing. And so he said, well, you know, too bad. We're just we're not gonna we're not gonna make anything for you anymore, right. and it cratered the company. Oof. So that they, they were bankrupt. I think within six months after that. So, you know, I'm sitting there, and it's my first job out of school, and you know, I think we're doing all the right things, and then this guy's ego got in the way. Uh, you know, these these two guys really, um, and it destroyed the company. So that was just a real wake up call right away <laughs> out of school that, yeah, those textbooks are great. Um, it's, I guess it's okay to know the theory behind some things, but the real world is different. <laughs> it's about the people, I guess, right? Yeah, well, absolutely, talk about, it's, it's yeah, absolutely talk, about the people. Talk about your introduction to the financial markets. What were, you know, what would you consider sort of your early experiences with the markets with investing? Well, it was, I've always been interested. Um, I mean, I picked up the Wall Street Journal, I think when I was 12, um, just which was which was hard to find in a, in a town like that. But I had no idea what any of the numbers meant, but it was just it was kind of fascinating to me. And I saw some articles in there about just people's money making money, which was just a complete foreign concept to me. So 
I was always kind of generally interested in, in the concept. So um, after that experience with the bike manufacturer, I, I was just kind of dinging around a, a bit, trying to find my place. And I went to a temp agency and I said, I just, I want to work at a brokerage firm. So whatever it takes, mailroom, whatever. And they called the next day and I, I didn't know this is kind of a cliche, but it was literally in the mailroom. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You live the dream. Everyone's up. Yes. So. Uh, yeah, it was, story. it was the That's lowest awesome. of the low for that, for that <laughs> part of it. So um, it was the online brokerage part of, of Wells Fargo. They were just kind of getting started. Uh, this was early, mid-90s, So, uh, which was great. I mean, I think there were five, six people uh, that worked for the firm at, at that point. And by the time I left in the late 90s, there were over 300. So um, it, it was great because I learned literally every piece of that job. You know, from the mailroom to uh, to staffing the trading desk, taking customer orders, um, managing the, the margin and options department, which really got me interested in the, the sentiment part of it. Uh, um, so that was great. I mean, the experience was fantastic. It was the you know the boom years, so you couldn't ask for a better time to to have that experience. Um, and you know, at the time, so when an online order went through, then um, Somebody could somebody could place it on the Wells Fargo website, their online online order, mm -hmm. and it would print off on this dot matrix printer, kind of over in the trading room. And then when somebody happened to notice there was a piece of paper sitting there, they'd go, "Oh, there's an order," and they'd they'd walk over, get it, and then put it into you know the Fiserv order entry system. So, right, you know, people just take the, take these things kind of for granted nowadays. But you know, an online it. order 20, 25 years ago. Uh, you know, it could take hours to get that actually executed. So I love how um, you put online order in air quotes there. Though. Yeah, I mean, it was <laughs> I, technically it was online, but it really was a physical type order. So, right. Um, right. But again, it was it was a really interesting time. And, um, you know, as I was as I kind of uh, worked through there and then ended up with the margin and options department, that was that was really eye opening, and you know it's kind of a topic today with some of the some of the things that are happening right now in some of these stocks, where I think a lot of people are getting margin calls that have no idea that that's even a thing. Um, yeah. And so, you know, as part of my job, uh, compliance wise, I had to listen to a lot of our margin clerks giving those margin calls, and it, it doesn't take you a, a very long time to understand that you know there's a whole lot of emotion here. There are real people and real money behind these, you know, these numbers. Um, and for me personally, it was kind of devastating because, you know, people would swear and they would yell and they would cry. And um, a lot of it just wasn't necessarily even just the money part. It was that these stocks hurt them. There was, we had this one woman, um, she always, she would call in every day and ask about my Qualcomm. That's what she would call it. <laughs> so she just, she'd personalize this one stock. That's the only stock she owned. She had right. it fully on margin. And so she did amazingly well until she didn't. Right. So, um, I mean, that it, in terms of like my formative experiences out of everything, I would say that, that, that actually that client is probably the number one because it just, it taught me so many things about how markets really work that, you know, yes, there are fundamentals. Yes, there are trends. Yes, there are. There are all these other things, but at the end of the day, it's it's a person generally <laughs> uh, placing an order, and they've got hopes and fears and all this other stuff. And to a large extent, that's what drives these moves. Yeah. Um, so for me, it was just it was unbelievably eye opening. Um, so in from that, I I decided to just kind of put together some indicators based on that data. So kind of what clients were carrying margin balances, um, when they would get a call, would they contribute more capital? Would they sell out? Would they not answer the phone? Which was quite popular. Uh, mm. This was uh, when Russia defaulted in 1998. Right. Uh, so our, our clerks would make calls at 1030 in the morning and then at two in the afternoon. And if they, didn't re if they couldn't hear from the client by two, then they would sell it out. Um, and I just, I remember very distinctly some of those days where they just they would come up to me and they'd be like, nobody's, nobody's answering their phone. And so we would just have to sell them out. So Jeez. again, it just, it teaches you a lot. Right. It's interesting. So besides the, um, I, I was, I'd love to ask about mentors besides the mentorship of some of these clients going through some of these experiences, are there any other mentors that you looked up to or sort of in your formative years as you were getting your feet under you that were especially meaningful or were you more learning on your own as you went? It was basically entirely on my own. Um, I mean, if I, if I had to pick mentors, it would be from books, you know, Victor Niederhofer and Norman Fosbach and, 
Alex Elder, Marty Schwartz, um, yeah. Marty Zwieg, of course. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, a lot of those guys just they, they had a they had an approach that really appealed to me, where it was somewhat systematized but also somewhat discretionary as well. And um, that was really the first approach where I saw kind of a an objective analytical approach to technical analysis, where it wasn't drawing lines out of chart that type of thing, where it was saying, okay, well, you know, if this indicator is at this level, this is how the market performed. And that just, it just, it, it greatly appealed to me, just kind of having that objective sense for something that's relatively subjective. And, and I love the way you just described it, because when I think of your work, and I love to talk about how you transitioned into sentiment traders, sundial capital researchers is where, where you're, what, what you're doing now, you know, how much of what you're doing as you think about your approach now is qualitative versus quantitative? Well, as much as possible is, is quantitative, yeah. but at the end, um, at the end of the day there, you, you have to use some experience. Um, you can, you can pick a number to, you know, justify anything that you want to, and it's a real danger. I mean, you know, back testing is great. Quantifying things is awesome. I think everybody should do it. There's really no excuse anymore. There are free tools available. Um, so I, I think having that base is extremely important, even with a limited amount of knowledge, you just don't need that much. Um, but you have to know kind of what to look for and more importantly, one to ignore. There's a whole lot of noise. There are a lot of traps when you start to try and quantify things. So, so you know, it's kind of a qualitative judgment, but with a quantitative base. I love that. Can you talk a little bit about how sentiment trader sort of came about? How did you transition into that particularly? Well, I, I thank my wife. Um, so after Wells Fargo, I, I just kind of felt I wasn't learning anything. I was, I was plateauing. It was getting kind of to be the same thing every day. So I went to a hedge fund um, <clears throat> here outside Minneapolis and it was essentially the same thing. There were still politics involved. Uh, and I just, I wanted to get out of that aspect of things. So, you know, I would go to work and every day be miserable and I would come home and, and my wife would say, you know, just <laughs> quit. I've got some funds in, in my retirement account. This is her talking. Yep. Uh, I'll take it all out. You can trade, do whatever you need to do, but just, I want you to be happy. So I owe everything to her, absolutely. Uh, and she did, she rated her 401k and I, I started trading, um, which was fine. But you know, when you're, and at that time I was also raising our, our newborn um, son. So, I mean, you can imagine that just the stress and it just, it doesn't work unless you've got That's a huge tough. capital. Yep. Yeah, very tough. Um, but I was always getting requests to update some of the measures that I was updating at Wells Fargo and just the information wasn't out there. I think uh, Schaefer's investment research had some, some data um, out there for free. And, but other than that, they're just, you'd have to go to the NYSC and then you'd have to go to the SIBO and you'd have to go to all these different places to kind of piece together some of this, um, you know, data on margin debt and options trading and things like that. So I just thought, well, just kind of for my own benefit, I would just create one spot um, just to update some of these indicators. So Yahoo was doing some deal where you could spend $19 and get a domain name and, and um, a basic web creation tool. Um, and it was, it was God awful ugly. I mean, I, I think you can go to the Wayback Machine and it's just, it's pitiful. So um, I'm, I'm not a designer. <laughs> by any so, so I just, you know, 19 bucks, I just started a website and just started updating some of these indicators. And um, I think I had a, a subscription link somehow, how they were doing it, where somebody could pay you, I, I think it was $9 a month or $5 or something. Right. Wasn't doing any advertising, wasn't doing, wasn't doing anything. And then I got an email one day just that somebody had subscribed and I was like, oh, oh, oh. Good. <laughs> somebody's paying me nine bucks or whatever. So at least it was just kind of a proof of concept that at least somebody out there you know, was looking for the same thing. Yeah. So just um, kept building it out and updating more indicators and, and tried to, you know, put some analysis out there and that, that type of thing. And, and then um, Gary B. Smith from realmoney.com or the street.com, I think at the time, yep. he'd mentioned the site and we got 300 subscribers overnight. And I, I was literally doing everything manually. So all of, our, all of the subscriptions were in an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, payment information was like handwritten on a piece of paper and in a locked drawer and uh, so 300 overnight was, was ridiculous. So I don't think I slept for like three days, just trying to get these people, you know, creating usernames and passwords. And it was just, it was a complete headache, but yeah. then it was kind of a real business where, you know, I, it was, it was, this was real, that there were actually 
quite a few people out there that were willing to, you know, look for this type of information. So for me, it was just a great um, confirmation of what I was doing yeah. um, and just took it from there and, and kept building. And, and um, I think we advertised once in 2004, 2005, I think I spent $1,900 on tradingmarkets.com and it was a complete bust. We got one subscriber. So I was like, this advertising thing is, I, I don't know what I'm doing. So, uh, <laughs> so from then it's just been organic word of mouth. Right. So and we've seen relatively small and, and um, you know, we have a niche where there's kind of an observer effect kind of thing where if everybody mm -hmm. knows about this and everybody acts on it, well, then it just, it goes away. So I think we can kind of see that like in some of the Ridex mutual fund data where when that really got popular as an indicator five, six, seven years ago, it really started to change and now some funds use it. And so you'll see the assets just spike up and down like that. You can maybe see it in the AAII sentiment survey. Um, I mean, it's an older group that take that survey, but you can kind of see how they behave differently now than they did in the past. And I think that's because they're aware that they're an indicator. Right. So, you know, some of those things like that, it's, you have to be a little bit careful, but, you know, in my experience, you can, you can show people this great indicator, um, usually about sentiment or something. Uh, yeah. And people are like, okay, that's great. Um, I don't believe it. <laughs> so, I mean, that's just, that's, that's just a huge part of it. So, you know, I think we could be huge and everybody would know about this and it would still work because people don't really believe it to some extent. Right. And about what year was it that you that you started Sentiment Trader when you're talking about launching the website? Uh, so I think I registered the site in 2002. Got it. Okay. So it's been going. So I had started it um, a few years before that and just yeah. that was offline, hard copy kind of thing, um, email, but yeah. the website itself was was 2002. So um, almost 20 years. Well, congrats on what you've done with it. I, and I know, I mean, I first came up on the site when I joined uh, Fidelity and and people were sort of sharing, here's what we look at, here's what we did. And, and the number of people mentioned sentiment trade. That's how that, I think how I was first introduced to, to you and your work. So that approach seems to be working okay. You know, as you, as you are talking about where you're located physically being in Minneapolis, even on your website, you make a point of you're far away from the you know, bustle of Wall Street. Can you talk about just being you know, geographically how you are uh, separate from that? Is that an advantage or a disadvantage for what you're trying to do, would you say? I think it's an advantage. Yeah. Um, you know, there's there's not the networking opportunities uh, here that there is in New York, uh, maybe California, although here in Minneapolis, there actually is pretty vibrant technical community. So uh, it's not so much that. But, um, you know, I think if I was if I looked at Wall Street every day, I think I would have a different opinion, a different different approach. Yeah. Um, and so I like just that we're separate, that we're not really by anybody. Um, and I think it's just having that physical location. I think it's, you know, maybe it's a mental thing, but I think it really does just make you think differently. Yeah. You, you know, you mentioned, and probably a lot of people don't know about the, it, it's a hotbed of technical analysis in Minneapolis. You've got it really is. the Loopold Group, you have uh, Ed Nikoski, who's at Piper Jaffrey for years. I mean, it's a whole, it's a whole collection of, uh, of charting happening there for sure. Um, you know, on your website, you mentioned in particular um, that it's not, what you're doing is not about market timing. It's more about risk management. Can you talk about how you approach things from the perspective of, you know, not just opportunity, but the risk side of the equation and how what you do lends more toward that thinking? Well, it, it's our primary focus. And, you know, whether there's a difference or not, I know market timing has a, you know, a bad rap, but a lot of it's just semantics. Uh, passive mutual fund investors are market timers to some extent. People who dollar cost average are market timers to some extent. So part of that, you know, I, I don't like to play that semantics game. I think it's, I think it's kind of silly, but um, a big focus of what we do is just looking at risk versus reward. And I, I know to some extent everybody does that, but we really try to quantify it. So all the myriad indicators that we look at dealing with sentiment and breadth and momentum, um, we just, we, we really try to objectively look, okay, under similar conditions, similar years, um, similar context, what was the risk? What was the maximum downside over multiple different timeframes? And what was the reward? And then try to come up with some kind of average from that. And it's great. I mean, it gives you a, a good baseline to work from, but you know, Mark, there, there are really no rules when it comes to auction, auction markets. So we look at tendencies, you know, we look at all these numbers and say, yes, this is, this is what tended to happen. Uh, it doesn't have to happen, you know, look at, Look at 1999, 2000, look at 2002, 2007, 2008, uh, 2013, 17. 
these trends can run much longer than, than these tendencies would, would argue. So over time, it works. I think it gives us a very good baseline to work from with the understanding that it's not perfect. You don't want to risk 100% of your capital on any of these ideas because you just never know. Uh, we're in the midst of that right now, February 2021. So um, yeah, it's again, it's a, it's a great framework to work from with that understanding that um, it's not perfect. You've obviously had a pretty successful career, um, uh, Jason, in terms of how you've navigated these markets. Can you talk about um, what mistake over your career you learned the most from? Oh, there's a lot of them. Can you pick one? <laughs> there's a lot of them. Um, most recently, I would say probably in 2013, there was, a, there was an absolutely perfect setup that uh, volatility should fall. Mm. So, I mean, it was, I, I don't know before or since if there was a more perfect setup. I mean, literally every single thing that we looked at, volatility has peaked, it's going to fall. Um, so I bought a, a, one of those toxic anti-volatility funds and volatility didn't fall, it, it kept rising. So it was just, it was one of those times where it's like, you know, I can have 30 years of experience. I can go through all these other bad experiences. I, I know objectively all these different things uh, and it could still, you know, work against you. So, mm. yeah, I mean, there were, there are times these, these, the absolute worst market environment for what we do is, is these creeper uptrends. Um, 2013 mm. was one of those, 2017 was another. Those are killer. Yeah. Uh, I mean, sentiment needs oscillations like any other oscillator. And when we don't get that and a market just gets stuck and it almost always only gets stuck to the upside, um, again, we're kind of in the midst of that right now. And it's just, it's kind of a killer for our type of analysis. Um, and we, you know, inevitably every single time we get comments, oh, you know, it's the Fed or it's a new generation or whatever, this stuff doesn't work anymore. You can't actually quantify how people are feeling and thinking about the market. Um, I mean, every time it's like, well, this stuff doesn't work anymore. Well. Yes, this time it didn't work. It will next time, and it's probably the time after. Yeah. Um, so it's just the risk is that you you get discouraged with one type of analysis, and then you just keep hopping from the hot thing to the to the next hot thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you know, a lot of different things can work. Momentum trading is fantastic. It can work extremely well, yeah. as long as you stick with it. Momentum, you know, trend following has a very low win rate, so you have to be able to tolerate those whipsaws and stick with it, so that you do catch those big trends. What we do is, is you know, more in and out. It can work excellent. It can pick some tops and bottoms. It can also get stuck. So you just don't want to, you know, get too discouraged about any one thing and just um, end up not really having any philosophy at all. Um, Jason, your website, uh, I think your tagline below sentiment trader says analysis over emotion. I hope people have gotten a sense from this conversation, what you bring to bear to try to help people uh, focus on their analysis over their emotions. If people want to learn more about you and what you're doing, where can we point them? Where can they uh, find you online? Just Sentiment Trader. We've got a, a free blog. It can give them a sense for kind of what we look at and, and how we do it or um, Sentiment Trader on Twitter. Fantastic. Jason, so good to sit down with you. Good to see you. I uh, hope you stay safe and we'll talk to you again soon. All right. Thanks, Dave. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.